Amen. How many's blessed this morning? How many was blessed by the singing this morning? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I had a couple of videos, but we're going to skip that. That was awesome. Uh, you'll have to hang with me this morning. I had something uh, totally different to bring this morning. I was going to talk to you from the story of the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. I wanted to bring a message called When What You See Is Not What You Want. But this week I have been um, watching and listening to many people who have shared dreams and visions. You know, we're familiar with a few. It's been uh, several months ago, maybe back in the summer, toward the end of the summer, uh, there was a pastor from Kentucky. Uh, his name is Dana Coverstone, who began to share dreams the Lord had given him. And many of you had seen it. We're sharing back and forth the links to some of these videos. Recently, uh, a pastor by the name of Kent Christmas uh, shared a, a vision or, or prophetic word at the event that was held last weekend called The Return. And I'm not sure how I got involved in, in doing what I was doing, but, but I was wanting dreams and visions that different people are having. I, I wanted to lay them beside each other. Because I, I believe the Lord is a, is a Lord of order. I, I believe there's no confusion. We know who the author of confusion is. It's the enemy. I also believe that I'm called to be a watchman. And, and I am to stand and, and to do what I need to do to protect and to watch out for those that the Lord has entrusted me to do. Now, I'm not standing here to tell you today that this one is of God and this was not of God and that one and this one and back and forth because I'm still trying to figure all of that out. I've, I've been trying to figure out if, if sometimes the differences that I am seeing has to do with different timing, that, that maybe God gave the first part of something to this one and it refers to a particular timing and then he gave to another a, a, another timing that occurs later and then another a timing that uh, that occurs later but in doing all of this reading and and watching and listening and and all of that after we got home last night and we changed our clothes and I sat down I watched a little football and and then I just turned the TV off and and I just was meditating on what I thought I was going to bring today and it was like the Lord began to to stir in me and to remind me some things that had been talked about in some of these dreams or visions or prophetical words. And I, I spent time, I remember looking, it was, I was, this was after 12 o'clock last night, and, and I was still wrestling and trying to figure out all that was was going on and, and uh, so I, I rather than write a lot of things or type things I just brought some of the sheets as I was going through them this was a, a dream that had to do with uh, October 2020 something's supposed to happen the second or third week of October and again on the 31st uh, it has to do with uh, seeing wicks on the heads of, uh, of people. These are governors and politicians, radicals. Uh, there's protests are going to go up a notch. Uh, saw a big billboard. It said Passover 2021. Big things are coming for, for the world. Brace yourself. There was a white figure that said that uh, the storm will not pass until I stop the storm. Then a dream that had to do with November said that they saw uh, they saw no sun in the in the sky. Uh, that they saw a particular victory for a candidate, but they saw placards and people that were protesting. 
saying an obvious winner is not so obvious. Uh, they heard three shots, three gunshots ringing out. They saw the president running for the beast, which is the name of his car, and that three of the agents, Secret Service agents, stepped in front of the shots that were fired, and the president was able to make it to the vehicle. And then they saw the church. They said there was a, a separation line. There's no middle ground at all. And they talked about how making sure to emphasize there's no middle ground. And it says those who refuse to be ready will be wanting in the end. So brace yourself and tell others I have, I have warned them to brace themselves for they are about to see more shocking things. And then he said, ready or not, nation, here it comes. Brace yourself. Then a dream for December and January and, and winter. Seeing more and more apocalypse. Long food lines, ships in port, sitting idle. No Christmas lights, no displays. Great sadness in the land. Shopping malls are turned into living quarters. Vultures with rotting food hanging out of their mouth. Depression, the markets crash, yields being lost. talks about vultures and the fact that his dreams are to warn America. He feels fear and he continuously hears the word brace yourself. Then Kent Christmas at the return said this, the greatest outpouring that you've ever seen is going to hit the United States of America. The Lord is going to break the Jezebel spirit and there's going to be glory. There's going to be peace in the land. 21, 2021 to 2024 is going to be the last final harvest. No demon can stop the glory of God that is coming. So as you can see, trying to figure out how those fit together when one seems to see gloom and doom and vultures and and fear and and long lines on into January in the winter and another saying the final harvest is coming is it is it that all the stuff that's happening will drive people to the Lord is it that the church is finally gonna come back to life again is it that we're gonna finally quit playing games and recognize that we are truly living in the last days? What, what, what does it mean? Who do we believe? What should we put our marbles in? The, the truth is Americans are, are people who like things to happen quick. Do you understand that one of the, one of the greatest money-making things in America is anything to do with a diet. Why do you think they constantly are coming out with new ways for you to lose weight? Because the last thing we tried didn't work. And so they keep creating these new things because people want to take a pill and not quit eating and not exercise. Y'all go ahead and look at me. We want what we want, and we want it now. We don't want to pay a price. We don't want to have to push away from a table. We don't want to have to change anything that is occurring in our life. And I believe that one of the reasons Dana Coverstone is seeing what he's seeing is because he, he's trying to get us to understand that if you won't change it, God will change it for you. 
See, if the church could ever get it in their head that God desires to do something great, He wants to use us. If we ever could get it in our head what He wants to do and how He wants to accomplish it, if we ever could get it in our mind that He comes first and all of His things come first and every other thing then will be added unto us, if we could ever get it together, the greatest harvest the world has ever seen, the greatest glory of God. Some people in this church may have been. I know we were able to go back in the late 90s to Brownsville in Pensacola, Florida to be part of the great outpouring, the Brownsville Assembly of God. It went on for several years where thousands of people were saved and lives were changed. You would go to that place and you would wait in line outside all day long in hopes that you could get in the building. Did you know if you go there now, there's just a few hundred people left. They've sold some of the other buildings and the other kind of ministries and other things that are taking place in other buildings. What happened? I understand you can get tired. I know you can get worn out. I know that sometimes you have to take breaks and you have to pull away and some things have to change. But brothers and sisters, if we ever lose sight that Jesus is coming, if we ever lose our passion that he could come at any moment, if we ever lose the, the fact that Jesus Christ could come while you're sleeping or while you're working or while you're separated from your children, if we ever lose that thought process, we're going to be in trouble be in trouble. I, I want there to be a last great day harvest. I want to see the glory of God fall in our church and fall in our neighborhoods and fall in our cities and fall in our nation. I want there to be peace on earth. But I know the scripture also says when they cry peace, peace, sudden destruction is coming. I listen to Listen to David Wilkerson preach in 1999 talking about the church, talking about the people. And I'm not here today to, to preach and talk about what somebody else said, but I'm telling you, whether or not we accept it, whether or not we believe it, whether or not we can make it all fit and this and that, and this is the first one, this is the second one. Well, you know, I, had to, I wrote them down and I wrote numbers so I could read them in order and whether or not we're able to process it that way in our mind, this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. The Lord loves us enough that He will send whoever and He'll use whatever He has to do to shake us, to get us to understand He sent Jesus to die so that we could be forgiven of sin him, so that we can live right so that we can go to heaven and be with him and he doesn't want anything to keep us away from him I hear the words of my mama echoing in my ear when she was about to give me a whipping with my own belt doing this because I love you come on love me with an apple pie Love me with no belt. His love goes on and on and on and on. We want him to love him, with, with, love us with great big arms. We want him to love us with blessings. But sometimes he loves you enough to chastise you. Sometimes he loves you enough to shake you. Sometimes he loves you enough if he has to discipline you. He will do it because he loves you. And his love goes on and on and on and on and on. I have no idea where I'm going this You see, the reason why I think it's important because if the church doesn't understand, how are we going to help folks who have no spiritual understanding? I mean, I literally, I sat there with earbuds in my ears and I'm, and I, and I'm writing things and I'm listening and I tried to trace back what, what, was this, what was this dream about and what month did it relate to? September's dream has already come and passed. 
There were supposed to be things that transpired in September, and, and so I started thinking, what happened in September? What were the headlines in the news? Other people were chiming in and said, well, you know, there were great fires that occurred out in California and, and other places. Did you know that over the last 10 years that, that they averaged 64,100 wildfires annually that, that burn on an average of 6.8 million acres? In other words, it's pretty common for there to be wildfires. But yeah, you sound skeptical. No, what I'm trying to get you to understand is, is if you don't understand... How are we going to help a lost world understand? See, this, this, is, this is why I am such a proponent for the Word. I love a lot of stuff. I love a lot of fluff. I love a lot of things. But brothers and sisters, when fluff is gone, brothers and sisters, when a lot of other stuff has come and gone, this Word will be available. This Word is here. It will not Every jot, every tittle, every dot of the eye, every cross of the T will stand forever. So when I'm confused, trying to make sense of what is being said, what order it goes in, why this one says gloom and doom and this one says peace and, and this one says Whoo, there's going to be the greatest harvest we've seen and or at least the four years is the last final harvest, and I'm trying to make it make sense. I hear the Lord saying, just, just go back and look at what I said. Go back and look at what I have told you. Now listen, I understand there's apocalyptic things in Scripture. There are things that if you thought it literally meant what it said, you would be afraid. I mean, the book of Revelation talks about beasts coming out of the water. It's not describing a little dragon. It's, it's in reference to something else. It is metaphorical. It stands for, it represents something else. And so we need help to understand what that is saying. But brothers and sisters, I'm going to stand on the Word. If somebody gives me a word and they say it's from the Lord, I want it to be verified by the word. I was disturbed where I saw somebody said, I know when Jesus is coming. And I'm like, bless God, I'm going to watch this and see what kind of loony thing they say. But what they said is that the scripture says he's coming in an hour when you think not. Jesus is coming when you ain't looking for him. Oh, excuse me. When you aren't looking for him. Jesus is coming when you don't expect him. And yet, Jesus said, we need to watch and pray. We need to keep our eyes peeled toward the eastern sky. He is coming. He's coming when you least expect it. But brothers and sisters, we as God's people ought to expect his any moment return. We ought to be looking for him to come. We ought to get up tomorrow and say, is this the day he's coming? People have been making pictures of beautiful sunsets, sunrises, the Lord painting beautiful pictures, orange and all kind of colors and rainbows. I've seen more pictures of rainbows this year. God is reminding us of his covenant that he has not changed his mind. But brothers and sisters, while we're looking at the rainbow and while we're looking at the orange colors of the sunset of the sunrise, we ought to be thinking this could be the day the Lord comes again. This is what his word says, 1 Thessalonians 4. Beginning verse 13, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. I don't want you to be misled. I don't want you to, I don't want you to have wrong, erroneous thinking concerning them that are asleep. I love the, the imagery of Scripture. He's talking about dead people. You see, sometimes we, we have this perception of death and, 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 you know, and it seems so final and it seems so separating. And yet the Bible describes for those that know Him, death is just sleep. It's, you, the body has gone to sleep and the spirit and soul has gone to God. And at some point in time, He's going to bring soul and spirit back together and change our body. And then we're going to be transformed to become just like the Son of God. Hallelujah! So don't worry about those that are asleep. As though you saw or not, as even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died 
and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. I'm saying this, Paul said, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which, we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The church in the time in which Paul is writing was a church that believed that Jesus could come back at any moment. And at the least, he was coming back in their lifetime. Their concern was is that some of their family and friends had died before Jesus came. And they were concerned because they thought that the only way you could go to be with Jesus when he comes is you had to be alive on the earth. And so Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, began to write to them and said, don't worry about your friends and family who's already gone on and already died. They, they, their soul is uh, with the Lord. Their body has gone to sleep. Don't worry about them. Death is not going to be something that's going to prevent them from being with Jesus. And then he goes on and describes, matter of fact, those that are dead are going to get up first. They're going to get up first. And then after all the dead have been resurrected, those that know Christ Jesus, then those of us that are alive and remain, then we get to get called up with all of them to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with Him forever. Any believer should believe that Jesus could come at any moment. I've heard it all my life. You want to know why? Because that's what we've always believed and taught. He could come at any moment. Now we do understand that because we believe in the rapture, and because we believe in a premillennial, in other words, we believe in, in not just a, a, a pre uh, a pre uh, thousand year reign, but we believe in the pre millennial, pre tribulational reign. In other words, we believe Jesus is coming. That's the beginning of the seven years of tribulation, and after the tribulation. And, and all of the battle of Armageddon, then the Lord comes back to make war. And after the Lord makes war, then the Lord sets up His kingdom on this earth and He rules and reigns for a thousand years. Because we believe in a pre-trib rapture, we believe in, in a pre-tribulational rapture, we do understand that there has to be certain things set in motion and in order that have to be able to trans fire or happen during the seven years in order in other words the antichrist has got to be alive and well on the earth now i don't know what you believe but i believe the antichrist is alive and well if we believe in the any moment coming of Christ, we've believed it all of our life we always thought this one was the antichrist and that one was the antichrist i heard the president of spain at one time was the antichrist i heard ronald reagan was the antichrist because all of his names had six letters in it. You remember that? Ronald, Wilson, Reagan. Six, six. You know, I've come to find out you'll never figure it out. You'll never figure it out. I read numerology, and, and they tell us that, you know, numbers play an important role, and, and so we're constantly looking at words in Scripture, and we're trying to figure out the number values, and does this uh, add up to be uh, the name beast? Does it add up to be Antichrist? This is what I've just come to tell you. We may not be able to figure it all out, but this one thing I know, Jesus is coming. And I believe it could come at any moment. And because I believe that, it behooves me to make sure that I am right with God and I'm ready to go. Are you right with God? Are you ready to go? You may not like it because I fry my eggs and you scramble yours. But don't let that be something that keeps us out of the kingdom. Churches have split 
over the color of carpet. Don't let that be something that keeps you out of the kingdom. I want you to hear me today. If I've ever been passionate, if I have ever tried to take my time and convince you that I am as serious as I've ever been, I want you to hear me this morning. If we believe that Jesus is coming, as a believer, it demands that we are ready to meet Jesus. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church without spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. The church is, is the body of people who are individually the church. I am the church. You are the church together. We are the church. The Lord died to present to Himself a glorious church. The church has not supposed to have spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It should be holy without blemish. Are we perfect? No. But we need to make sure we're covered. We need to make sure we're doing our best to live. We need to understand as a believer, we don't know the exact moment he's coming. How many of you ever bought a book called 88 Reasons He Would Come in 1988? I, I wouldn't raise my hand either. There was a guy who wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why He Was Coming in 1988. Every now and then you can find one and it's got a dime written on it. You can buy it for a dime. I don't want to read a word of it. Because the word is very clear. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Not the angels. Only the Father. But because we don't know, and because we know He could come at any moment, you need to be ready. Matthew 24, beginning of verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one left, and one is taken, the other left. Watch ye therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. We don't know when He's coming, but He's coming. And because you don't know when, you know how we do. Pest control was coming Friday to the house. We had a day warning that it was coming. But sometimes you forget things. And so typically, they only want to spray on the outside, but every now and then, we like them to come on the inside. And so they've learned to ask. So after he had sprayed around the outside, he said, you want me to, uh, you want me to spray on the inside? I said, you'll have to ask her. So he went to the back door, knocked, nobody came, so I went in the house. And I said, Renee, that's not my other wife, that's her middle name. Renee, what? And the bug man wants to know, do you want him to come inside? She said, I'm not prepared for him to come in here. And the house was clean, but she had a pile of clothes. She didn't want nobody seeing, I guess our bloomers, I'm not sure what it was, but. He can't come in. See, we had the option to tell him whether we were ready for him to come in or not. Because we weren't ready, we didn't let him in. Brothers and sisters, there's no option when Jesus comes. There's no chance to get ready. No opportunity to pray. No opportunity to dust yourself off. It is the state you're in when the trumpet sounds. When he steps off the throne. When he steps onto the cloud. When he comes in the air. It is your condition at that moment. My question is, are you ready to meet Jesus? Brother Terry, you're talking to the church today. You're talking to believers today. You're talking to people who love Jesus today. I love you enough just to ask the question, are you ready? People are watching us online. Are you ready? People will watch us after the fact. Are you ready to meet Jesus?
Jesus wanted us to understand that he is faithful. That's why we ought to be faithful. John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house for many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is what Jesus promised. Jesus said, I am going away to prepare a place. And when I get it prepared, I am coming back to get you. I told you last week on Sunday, I told the class on Wednesday night, Again, God is not a God that he can lie. It is not possible for God to lie. So if Jesus said, I'm going back, but I'm coming again, you can guarantee yourself he is coming. Are you ready? He's faithful to do what he said he would do. Not only did Jesus say it, there were angels when Jesus ascended to heaven reminded us, Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And while they looked up steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go up into heaven. The same way he's going up, he's coming down. Glory to God. Jesus said it. The angels also told us he's coming back again. Are we ready? Are we ready? When I was a little kid, we didn't have Nintendo, PlayStation, Xbox. I'm probably dating myself. I don't know what all they have now. We didn't have all that. My wife and I were talking about it coming back when we first got married. We had three channels. They just started the fourth channel. We were, we were so excited. We had another option. Glory to God, four. We were outside. If it wasn't raining... And we'd done homework. We were outside. We climbed pine trees and then got whipping because we had pine rosin on our clothes. Heard my mama say it many times when I came home from school. And I played football and crawled around and I had grass stains and dirt stains on my knees. And she said, I'm going to make you scrub these pants. My bursitis hurts. If you don't quit crawling around, I'm going to make you scrub your own pants. Come on, y'all been there, hadn't you? We didn't have all the things that kids today have to occupy themselves. We played games outside. We caught lightning bugs. Put them in baby food jars. Or we mash them and put them on our forehead. <laughs> we caught June bugs. I don't see them much anymore, but we catch June bugs and we tie a string on their leg and fly them around like a kite. We catch ladybugs. My wife, she was she was uppity. She knew which bumblebee you could catch and not get stung. They caught bumblebees in their hands. She, she better off than I was. I, I didn't mess with. What I'm trying to get you to understand is we used to play one game. It was called hide and seek. The same words that one of the men who had a vision or, or, or gave a prophetical word, the Lord said, ready or not, here I come. I got plenty more that I wanted to share, but for some reason I, I feel like I need to slow down right here. And I need to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from today. Ready or not. I remember telling you about my friend, Curtis Rogers. When I was a senior in high school. We, we and another guy or two, we, we played tennis together all the time. And I used to try to invite some of my friends to come to church with me. Curtis Rogers just would not, he would not come and he would say, you know, I'm, I'm going to wait till, till if there is such a thing as a rapture, I'm going to wait till it happens. And then after that happens, I'll know it's right and real. 
And then I'll commit my life to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if you can't make that decision now, while it's the easiest it's ever been, what makes you think you're going to make it once the church is gone and all hell begins to break out on this world? What makes you think that you're going to have to take some mark in order to buy or sell? What makes you think you're going to be able to stand and say, no, I won't take that and let your family starve when right now all you've got to do is surrender to the Holy Spirit who's bringing conviction on our hearts and saying, just help, just receive me. Just let me change you. What makes you think that when it's the easiest it's ever been to give your life to Jesus, that you'll do it then? Jesus is saying, ready or not, here I come. Ready or not. This is what I believe. And if I believe wrong, you can have a meeting with a council and y'all can put me on the road. I believe there's some folk in the church who've been told they're saved. But the honest truth is, they don't really know if they're saved or not. Because you can always tell when you ask people, do you know the Lord? Yeah, I belong to the church. That's not what I ask you. I didn't ask you, was your name on a roll? I didn't ask you, had you ever been dunked in water? I didn't ask you, did you have a baby certificate where you've been dedicated to the Lord? What I ask you is, are you ready? When Jesus comes, can you go? Not is your name on a church roll. If you're counting on your church membership at some local church as what gets you into heaven, you need to come to this altar today. Because your church paper membership is about as useful as this composition paper. Now don't misunderstand me. Church membership affords you opportunities to do things for the kingdom at that local assembly. But God is not going to look in the book. <laughs> he doesn't have a section that says Sweetwater Church of God. No, He just has a book of life and He wants to know, is your name written there? I, I think there are people in churches who are confused at what real salvation is. Some of us think real salvation is works. I, I, you know, I have to knock on X amount of doors. Listen, brothers and sisters, I believe that if you're saved and born again, you'll want to work for the Lord. But it is not my works that make me worthy to go to heaven. It is that I'm saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus. I oh, always loved that hymn we used to sing at Chris, uh, Easter when I was growing up. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how, I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Not my name is on some roll. Not that I've been baptized in water. I just know that Jesus lives in me. How many know Jesus lives in you? Woo! Hallelujah! I got to quit, but our, our text I originally read, First Thessalonians 4, Tells you four important things that you need to remember. Number one, it talks about His return. The Lord Himself shall descend. He's not going to send somebody else. He's not going to send somebody else. He's not going to send an angel. He's not going to send some Old Testament biblical character. The Lord Himself is coming. That's how much he thinks of you. Served on staff at a larger church. There were times when we would go to the hospital. We had certain days that were our 
hospital day. And so we went to visit the sick. And if somebody had surgery, unless it was something extremely major or the family requested, whoever was on call that day was the people who showed up at the hospital. And there were times and some folk didn't want somebody else. They wanted the preacher. <laughs> I remember being uh, judging a senior adult talent competition in Columbia, and I, my phone kept going off, and I kept silencing, and it kept going off, and I finally asked them for a, a break. Let me check, see what was going on. And one of our members, older members, was in the hospital, and they wanted the pastor. That was me. And I told him, I said, I'm, a, I'm in Columbia. Even if I left right now, it would take me an hour and a half to get back from, from where I am to where they are. And I said, but what I'll do is I'll send somebody. So I sent the former pastor, the one who was the pastor for a long time and had just retired. And I sent them and I said, now when I get done and I get out of here, I'll come to check on you. And sure enough, I did. I didn't even go home. I went straight to that house. And when I walked in the door and they said, I needed you. I said, listen, I sent you your pastor you had for years. And they said, but he ain't the pastor now. Y'all quiet. See, what happens in the church is oftentimes we train up people, we raise up people, and those people go in our stead. They go in our place. Do you understand that's what the Lord did? That when Jesus went away, he said, one of the reasons I'm going to send the Holy Ghost is because when he comes into you, I'm going to authorize you and empower you to do what I did. Jesus said, the works that I have done, greater work shall you do. Not greater in dimension, but greater in possibility because there's more of us who have the power to get out there and to do the work. But when Jesus comes, he's not going to send some authorized person the Lord Himself is coming. Second thing our text says, it talks about a resurrection. The dead in Christ are going to get up first. Third thing it says, it talks about a rapture. They're going to get up, and then those of us who are alive will be caught up. Can y'all just pray for me for a second? Can I pray for you? I can't hear you. Pray for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Nothing wrong with me. Don't worry about me. Rapture. Catching away. There's interesting words. It said we'll meet him. It's a word in the Greek that literally means it's reserved for an important person that was going to visit a city and the people would go out to meet him. That's the same word that's being talked about when Jesus comes in the clouds. We're going to meet a very important person. The one who died for us. The one who shed his blood for us. We're going to meet him in the clouds. When you look in the scripture, clouds represent the presence of God. He led them when they left Egypt. A fire at night and a cloud by day. We're going to meet him in a cloud that shows his presence. We're going to meet him in the air. That's interesting. Do you understand where the domain of the devil is? He is the prince of the power of the what? And where are we going to be called up to and meet Jesus? You want to know what that is? That's Jesus thumbing his nose at the devil and said, You thought this was your domain, but I have mastery over you. I have authority over you. The last thing our text tells us, Tracy, come on so I can... Land this plane. It talks about a reunion. There are two reunions that I see here. There's a reunion of all of those that have already died and gone on 
and all of us who may be alive and remain, all of our family, all of our friends, all of our loved ones that have already gone to be with Jesus, they're going to be in that number and we're going to be reunited. Oh, I want to tell you. You talk about a happy day. You talk about a grand reunion day. You talk about a time I don't want to miss. And that's being able to be a re, re, have a reunion with my grandmother and my grandfather and my grandmother on my, on my, my mama's side. To be able to be reunited with folks that, that helped me just by watching their life. Irene Smith and Louise Brock and other people that have already gone on to be with Jesus. That I watch them as they live their life in front of me every day. I watch people whose spouses weren't saved and really made it hard for them to even get to church. But they came anyway. They're the people that taught me tenacity. It taught me Jesus is worth living for no matter what's going on in this world. No matter how hard it gets, you stick with Jesus. You stick with Jesus. You keep your eyes on Jesus. There's a reunion of those that have gone on to be with the Lord. There's also a reunion for those of us who have met Jesus through salvation, but I've never seen Him with my eyes. In that moment when He catches us up and we meet Him in the air, and the Scripture says, we'll ever be with the Lord. I will finally get to see my Savior face to face. Oh, I know they've depicted what He looks like for me. For most of us, He looks like a white man. I'm not sure Jesus was lily white. Go ahead and get mad if you want to. I just know He was Middle Eastern. I don't know whether Jesus had really long hair or shoulder length. I don't know the color of His eyes. I don't know. But when I see Him, I will know Him. And I will see Him with my eyes. I'll finally get to see the one who died for me. The one who shed his blood for me. The one who was nailed to the cross for me. The one who went by the whipping post and took stripes on his back so I could be healed. I'm going to be... I'm going to have a meeting with that one. You remember that old church song we used to sing? Out of the old hymn? There will be a happy meeting in heaven, I know. When we see the many loved ones we've known here below gathered on that blessed hilltop with hearts all aglow, that'll be a glad reunion day. Glad day, a wonderful day. A glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels and loved ones to stay. That'll be a glad reunion day. Brothers and sisters, friends, people in the room, people who could be watching live or you're watching it after the fact. I want you to hear my heart today. There's a lot of things that I'd like for us to be able to do together. I was supposed to go fishing with the men and because of our granddaughter being sick and in the hospital, we weren't sure if we were going to be needed to keep grandbabies and so we were kind of on call and then we felt like we needed to support our son and daughter-in-law and they kept sending me pictures I, it looks like I missed a good time I know the one time I got to go other than freezing to death I had a great time there are a lot of things I, I want to do with us. I want to do together with you. I want to go places. I want to see things. I, I want to be involved in things. But brothers and sisters, if we never get to do any of that, would you promise me you'll meet me in heaven? I said, promise me. Promise me. 
Listen, you can do that today if you don't know Jesus Christ. You can do that. You can fix it. You can respond to the wooing of the Holy Ghost right now. He's bringing conviction to let you know that the state you're in is not conducive to going should He come today. So what He's doing is calling you to come and make it right. Come and confess your sin. Come and repent. Come and turn your back on your past life. Receive Jesus. Accept Jesus. Jesus, invite Jesus in. Maybe you're here today and you've known Jesus, but you've, you've turned your back on Him. I, I can't get the picture of the prodigal son out of, my, out of my mind, how that he came to himself. Or one translation says he came to his senses. He got up from where he was and he said, I'd rather be a servant in my father's house. And so he made his way back home. It's time, it's time to get a glimpse of the father and recognize that it's so much better in the father's house than it is where you are. It's so much better serving the king of glory than it is serving whatever you're chasing after right now. Come home. sing a song and come home it's supper time come home the shadow is dimming fast come home come home supper time. maybe you know the Lord and there's really not sin in your life but the truth is you've gotten distracted by fluff fluff by stuff instead of watching and gazing you've been watching and gazing other stuff and the Lord is saying today today's a today to get a check up on your eyes and get your eyes fixed in the right place and do what you need to do today if I were to die I'm talking about me if I were to die today Let's say I was able to get in my vehicle and I was able to make it home, but something happened to me before we can get back to prayer meeting tonight. I want you to remember my statement. Promise me. Promise me. You'll meet me in heaven. Promise me. If you can't make that promise today, then it's time to get it fixed. Father God, in your mighty name today, I'm asking you today to touch us in this time of altar service. This is not a time to walk out. This is not a time to dismiss. This is not a time to leave early unless there's some emergency. Because, Lord, this is serious business. This is a moment of time where we are being asked to search ourselves to make sure that we are ready to meet the Lord. Father God, I want the, my friends, I want my church family, I want the people that I've come to love over the last two years, I want them to be able to promise me that they'll meet me in heaven. And if they can't make that promise right now, I pray, Lord, that they'll walk this aisle and find a place and let us help them through until they have an assurance that they're ready to meet the Lord. Lord, move on us, move in us, move through us in the name of Jesus. I'm asking everybody to stand all over the building if you would. If you don't know that you are ready to meet Jesus, I'm not talking about a scared straight moment, but if that's what it takes, I'll do it. I'm talking about you've heard the voice of the Spirit heard the Spirit of the Lord speak. And you, were to, you know that if He were to come today, any moment as you are right now, you're not ready to meet Him. Whether you've known Him and gone away, whether you've never known Him, or whether you know Him but your eyes aren't fixed and you want to get them fixed again, I'm begging you to let's make it right today. In the name of Jesus, whatever you got, Sister Tracy, sing it for us. I'm opening these altars. I want you to come if you're not ready. In the name of Jesus.